Hello and welcome. This is exclusive interview on AD4 TV Radio. I am Tunde Hassan. My guest on the show is adept with a question of public conscience for the good of society. He joins me shortly to engage some salient issues on how credible and ethical are those who seek to promote the greater good and hold others to account on the premise of he who comes to equity must come with clean hands. Stay with us. He who comes to equity must come with clean hands. This is a burden of responsibility for individuals and advocacy groups that take up the task of being the public conscience. This is a high ideal laced with ethics, strong moral code and integrity in pursuit of the greater good for all. It is about defining and standing up for what would pass for the best interests of the public. It is a judgment call that reinforces and deepens a sense of accountability to hold individuals, institutions and groups to account on the basis of principle and the highest standards. Public conscience goes beyond government but also captures the reaction of the citizens towards happenings in the society. Institutions such as the mass media, the academia, religious bodies, traditional leaders, civil society organizations all play the role of the public conscience. Social critics in the public space, opinion molders, activists, advocacy groups, technocrats, community leaders, professional bodies all play a part in the whole question of public conscience. The extent to which the interventions of these public conscience platforms make a difference sets the ethical and moral benchmarks for accountability and sanity and order in the conduct of public affairs for the good of all. When the wrong choices are made, the state and society suffer from lack, stagnation, indignation, corruption, poverty and anarchy, among others. In recent times, however, there have been lots of cases of leaders being caught in between conscience and career. Citizens are also caught in between turning a blind eye to the wrong doings in the society or standing up to holding to account those whose actions and inactions impact on society. Take the specific case of whistleblowing, for instance. Some see them as cynics and pessimists, to whom nothing is ever good enough. Others see them as extremists, troublemakers, rabble-rousers, or posturing grand standards. Yet, Others consider them as a necessary check and sense of awakening in an open democratic society. In all instances, the survival and well-being of the state depends on the good decisions. The overall goal is to create awareness that can bring solution to the society in an ethical, organized, just, principled and inclusive manner. The survival of the state and society depends on well thought out decisions. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, this is exclusive interview and I have with me in the studio as my guest, a public affairs analyst. I prefer on this platform to call him an ethicist, Malam Ilyasu Gadu. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much. I'm glad to be here. We're looking at the <coughs> critical question of public conscience. Give us an understanding, your understanding of what, this, what, what are the principles that drive, what are the major planks that drive public conscience? Well, when you talk about public conscience, you you first of all have to look at the ideal. The ideal of what public conscience, consciousness entails is, you know, a kind of 
putting together ideas for the public good. And then the public good here, the definition of public good here is not just about one section of society, but the totality of society. And people who drive uh, the issue of public consciousness take into account, you know, the totality of a society or a country or as the case may be, and they look at some of the issues that are of germane interest that cover the entire spectrum of society from top to bottom. And then in this I'm minded by a saying that says, look, in every society there has to be what is called enlightened self-interest. In other words, for the good of society we have to behave in certain manner that would make all of us accountable for our actions, for our deeds, and for our responsibilities to the state or to the society. And then in that manner, we are organized, you know, to be able to, in our own ways, to be able to at least contribute to the general good of society. That's the ideal. Now, it differs from society to society mm. because of the kind of cultural mores mm. that drive society. In some societies, you know, that are, per, for instance, religion-based, most of the issues of public good and public consciousness are driven by religious, you know, thinking, thinking and religious interaction. So, so, so in, other, in other societies, some of the issues of public consciousness are driven by, they've taken away religion out of it, and then are driven by laws agreed laws by agreed you know conventions where people regardless of whether which religion or which factions they belong a kind of you know enveloping ideal a enveloping code of practice that governs them so they, they are not necessarily give, you know driven by religious ethics or religious uh, you know instructions but by laws by you know laws which are codified and made by people for the good of the society and you are obliged to obey them in the interest of society for instance some of the issues in those kind of societies that are normally supposed to be handled by family family convey families you know structures are actually taken over by the state because the state believes that you know if you leave it to the family there will be a lot of you know there could be a lot of uh, imbalances so it's better to leave it uh, it's better to define and codify laws that would be of equal application to everybody. For instance, in some societies, your father, for instance, does not have a right to smack you. Mm. It's, it's, mm. It's, it's regarded as, you know, a, an abhorrent behavior. But in some societies, it is taken as normal for your father to smack you if you misbehave or something like that. But in some societies, it's not. And if you are seen doing that, there's the, the, the law applies to you. So these are some of the things that, you know, you know, no, in, in those areas, the, among the things that you, um, what really stand out, I mean, it's a kind of balancing between um, the social preferences in a society, uh, the laws that apply to everybody, and some level of morality uh, in, in, the, in the context of Nigeria. Where have we situated, where can we situate Nigeria in the context of all of these planks uh, that drive public conscience well in the context of Nigeria it's a bit difficult to really define what really is drives or what really should be public consciousness because we're a country that is that that, that has so many uh, ethnic groups so many cultures existing within this Nigerian framework and some of these cultures have different approaches and different opinions on cultural morals you know some, 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 you know, so, so, some are religion based, mm. some are social based, some are family based, mm. and then you know it's difficult. It has been very difficult to get a consensus. Even the law, the laws that we have that are supposed to govern, that are supposed to be it's like kind of an average, uh, of, of of average applications, sometimes get mad in some of these issues, religion family culture and all that sometimes you see somebody for instance somebody you know you know misappropriates funds interested in his care and it's clear that it's it's, it's an infraction of the law an mm. infraction of society mm. but then some somebody some people come and say look 
He is our boy. He is our son. He should be let. Nobody should uh, should take him. And we've seen that happen in several occasions. And on several occasions, where somebody, for instance, you know, you know, uh, you know, appropriates what should be a public funds or for public, uh, you know, finances. And you know, when when the when, when the law is ap is applied in this case, in his own case, is people say, look, my friend, this man. We don't see anything that is what okay. has done wrong. Uh, I mean, this this question of infractions that you mentioned, we see a lot of these infractions that have held the development of the people, of the nation, of the entire society down. Yeah. Nobody seemed to be pointing fingers at these issues in in a very principled, organized manner. For instance, politicians. I just throw this question to you. When was the last time you had any politician speak decently, any decent conversation on the critical issues that are affect this country? Jobs, health, food on the table, major things that affect the people. Yeah. Politicians don't talk about it, and we don't hold them to account. Yeah, at the, well, at the base of it all, it's because the kind of what, what drives the politics in Nigeria. As we all know, Politics in Nigeria is not driven by ideology, as it is now. In the past, it used to be there used to, there used to be some ideology-driven politics. For instance, where you have people uh, parties like PRP, for instance, party like parties like you know, part parties that tend to look t tend to organize themselves around the issues of public good, around the issues of social consciousness and all that. Yes, and they're driven in that manner. But now we have a situation where our politics is not driven by these ideas. They are not driven by, you know, by, 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 by the need to, to go for the public good. They are driven by individuals getting themselves together, using the powers, this influence they have in society to try to organize themselves and to try to see how they could get the best or the, the, uh, for, their, for themselves. So when you hear them talking about issues like issues like uh, jobs and all that, it's about it's opportunistic most of the time mm. to actually advance their own interest. And the same people who talk about this things are the ones who also invariably responsible for some of the issues that we are grappling with today. So it's it's a it's a very very serious contradiction in our society because the people who are supposed to lead, who are supposed to put out the marker in terms of behaviors, in terms of you know behavioral practices that we are the same that bridge that, that bridge it. For instance, you look at you look at you know uh, you, you look at for instance the, the, the law on traffic regulations and all that. The people who are supposed to you know obey uh, who who make the laws for the traffic regulations are invariably the ones that flout the traffic regulations. So so in that case, there's a lot of contradictions. We are talking about just in that aspect. There are several other aspects of our own life, public life. That that, that 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 you know we see happening, where this the people who are supposed to make the laws, who are supposed to guide the laws, who are supposed to actually give us a model of behavior, are the ones who actually go against the law. So it's a con contradiction in, in 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 of sorts, and you know in that situation, you know the people down at the down at the at the lower spectrum of society are bewildered. And they also, you know, resort to self-help, <laughs> as these other people are doing. Now, let, let's look at, uh, I mean, th there are some I certain ideals that we cannot close our eyes to. There are institutions that ordinarily are expected to drive public conscience. The media, for instance, religious institutions, for instance, um, the civil societies, organized and unorganized uh, elements within the civil society um, even technocrats in the civil service uh, are they sufficiently do they sufficiently understand what is required of them take the media yeah I will refer you to well for an answer to this I will refer you to an occasion where I attended when I was in my days as a you know practicing journalist in Lagos and it was you know, a briefing session by a commissioner in one of the a commissioner in the Lagos cabinet, and while 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 he was making his point, he was briefing the the public. Uh, the journalists were there and all that, and so some journalists kept asking him questions to the point that he became exasperated, and mm -hmm. he was so quite so 
agitated and worked up. And so he lost his cool. And he said, too, look, you guys are taking me on here. Fine. I don't, I don't mind. But if we were to search, put the, uh, put the searchlight on the activities of you, of you journalists, and the way your proprietors run your outfits, hmm. it's even worse. It will, you find that it will even be worse than what we, what you are putting against us. I, and then the man said, I know a lot of you who come here to me asking to be helped, to be assisted because you've not been paid, you know, salaries and things like that for the past six months or so. So we as, you know, uh, as public officers, yes, we have a right, we, you, we, we have to get back to the public to be able to tell them what we've been doing, to be able to brief them on what we do. But if we were to search, put the search light on you guys in your industry, it would even turn out worse things than what you are accusing us of now this is to tell you the, the whole the, see the whole ownership of the media in nigeria you know is is part of the i mean is actually takes the large share of the blame why we, we don't have journalists of conscience because you know they determine the type of things that go into in, into print or into or or or, or 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 what is said on air and things like that in the media and Invariably, you find that the people who own these media, sh who own these uh, outfits, are also part of the, you know, uh, the, 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 the the situation we have in the country. So, so in, invariably, you cannot be, you cannot go beyond what your publisher or what your proprietor says, and that's the media alone. And so, the media, and also the also the media is also beholden to some of the interests mm. that that run in Nigeria. Partisan interests like religion, ethnicity, and what have you. So, so most times, you know, the media instead of looking at the public, the general good, and defining their you know activities on that basis, tend to pander to some of these issues because they are already beholden through their public uh, proprietors or publishers, and through their uh, you know political partisan interests mm. to try to you know create a situation where you know uh, you know where media is not actually you know, does not actually come up deliver the goods that is expected of them the media in all society is supposed to of course you know that certain i mean you cannot you can you cannot hide from the fact that certain media have to have you know some opinion but at the end of it all the public good must guide the uh, the, the the conduct of the media but in the case of nigeria it is lost because of a number of factors, because of the publishers, because of the proprietors' interests, because of the issues of ethnicity and religion, and because of partisan issues. So the media, you know, finds itself, you know, in a situation where it cannot rise up to become, to play the role that is expected of it as a sentinel of social conscience, conscience. Okay. consciousness. Well, as it is, um, the downside we see with the media is also reflected in other institutions and spheres that should drive public conscience. Uh, we will re uh, come back shortly to engage some of these downsides as they are and to see the extent to which ethics and good conduct, uh, which are major plans that drive public consciousness um, or, or the public conscience are at play within our own client. Stay with us. There's a wind of change blowing over Nigeria, and it's coming from the Tertiary Education Trust Fund. If you want to find out how TED Fund is bringing the Nigerian government, industry, and the academia together to drive a new knowledge economy, tune in to this station every Wednesday at 8 p.m. for TED Fund, The Paradigm Shift. It's informative, it's innovative, and it's exciting. TED Fund, The Paradigm Shift. Proudly produced by 84 TV Radio. You're welcome. Still on exclusive interview on 84 TV Radio, and I have uh, Madam Ilias Ugado with me uh, discussing the core issue of public conscience. I mean, before we took that break, we'll <coughs> engage in some of the institutions that ordinarily should drive. Uh, the very processes of uh, 
public conscience for the general good, the media, for instance. And you pointed to some of the, the issues that is kind of are obstacles to making the media serve that purpose. Now, is it, a, I mean, we're talking about holding people, institutions, and the state to account. Who then hold those who are holding others to account? Yeah, that, that, that's the chicken and egg situation. <laughs> because <laughs> the truth about it is that in the, in the not so distant past, we used to have a very vibrant civil society organizations that stood up to you know to to pursue issues of public good, people public conscience, and we've seen mm -hmm. the results you know of those endeavors. But again, you know, we come back to the same issue: who organizes this? Who funds this? this? Who in whose interests are this? been driven. Well, earlier you talked about enlightened self yes, yes. Can we aggregate it to become like a consensus? Yeah, but that's a question because the, the, the in every society, I mean, there's always an elite that drives that society, one way or the other. The elite is the drives the society. And the elite arrive at driving society based on certain ethics. Ethics morals that you know they agree and say look this is what we want to do and we want to es establish this as kind of code of ethics that we first of all apply to ourselves and, and and in process apply to the rest of society and that is what is called enlightened self-interest and that look for the good of society for the good of the elite who are the leaders of society want to make sure that these modes these codes apply to us so let, let the people out there in the lower spectrum of society see that we are actually, you know, applying these modes and codes to ourselves first. And then so when we now, you know, when we now try to get the lower spectrum of society to behave in a certain manner, they will know that, yes, we are doing it in a way that would be of, you know, greater good for society. So in a situation where, for instance, one of the elite, you know, is seen to, you know, to, 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 abuse the public trust placed on him, the law takes its course. It's not a matter of, you know, hiding behind any religious or any... That ethnic. Is that happening here? It's not happening. So that's why, you know, the whole thing is so contradictory. Because the same people who would want, who tell you they want the best for the country or for the society are the same guys who do not apply them, who do not want to apply them. For instance, a typical Nigerian, uh, go to the airports, for instance. There are certain conventions, there are certain, you know, rules about airport behaviors in airports around the world, you know, and, you know, uh, everybody in every part of the world, uh, in decent parts of the world, these behaviors are applied. Uh, 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 people are compelled to behave in a certain manner as per the definitions of how to use an airport. I've taken, an, I've, I've been, an, I've been, you know, in, 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 in an airport in UK, for instance, where you see Nigerian VIPs yeah. complying with the regulations of the airport protocols. But as soon as they come down to Nigeria, they behave in a different manner. You see a car driven right to the tarmac to pick up this so-called VIP. Now, this is, look at these other contradictions. Which will never happen yeah, if, exactly. they are, if they had been in other countries. Exactly. I mean, a few hours back, the same VIP who now has a car driven right, you know, to the tarmac to pick him, would check into the airport, into the into the plane, into the flight by himself. No aids, no hangers, or no flunkies around him. But as soon as he comes to Nigeria, it's a different. Thing. And I remember a former Attorney General of Nigeria, who was on, who was interviewed on air, just like we are having an interview, and he said, "Look, he retains two brains." One brain for behavior abroad and one brain for behavior in Nigeria. This is to tell you how the elite of Nigeria, who are supposed to, you know, engage in what is called enlightened self interest, behave in this way. So, why are we, uh, where are these elite here? And um, why are they wired that way? Yeah, it's because it's, it's they take liberty at everything. Yeah, it's, it's actually part of, you know, the, the makeup of the society itself, the country itself.
So you can't hold them to account. The society is responsible for the the, the deficit we're talking about. No, it's, it's the way it's the way is the way we the, the kind of uh, what do you call it now? The kind of um, uh, um, uh, the kind of culture we have, the kind of um, uh, of morals we have, and the kind of you know. Uh, the way we, we structure our society, we believe, you know, that certain people are untouchable. Certain people can behave they want to behave any way they want to behave, and the law will not apply to them, or they can. They, in fact, the law itself is not meant for them. So they take liberty at that, and then they behave the way they behave, and they, and then, and then, and then they come out again tomorrow and tell you, you must behave in this manner. The kind of do as I say kind of behavior, mm. and not as I do. So you cannot organize a society on that basis. You for, you, for instance, when I, was, when I was living and working in the UK, I was on occasion on the same queue with the Prime, Minister, with the Prime Minister's husband, that's Mrs. Thatcher's husband, on the same queue in a bank. At the time, the, at the time his wife was the Prime Minister, then it's Thatcher, in Northwest, Trafalgar Square. Now, you can't have that happen in Nigeria. The husband of the prime minister on the same queue mm -hmm. with the, with the, in the public with it can't happen and that's not because i mean Ms. Dennis because Thatcher, it shouldn't yeah then Thatcher being on that queue does not mean he does not take anything away from him it is the way the convention of society has come up and you, you see this happening all over europe all over the decent you know uh, societies because, because they've come to a conclusion that look we need to set examples, good examples. We need not to behave as if, you know, the law cannot or should not apply to us. And if we do behave in that manner, we can then order the society in that way. So, you know, it becomes part of receipt behavior. Mm -hmm. Nobody needs to be told what to do. Mm -hmm. They do it as part of growing or part of the culture, part of society, part of, you know, uh, the way of life of that society. But here, it's the other way around. Must we do things the way it's done there? Well, there are certain aspects of our culture, definitely. Respect and all that, that, that there. But respect must be earned. Mm. It mm. must not be implied. Mm. It must be earned. Mm. And it must not be at all times. Respect must be earned. It must be reciprocal. If you are given respect, you must also behave in a manner that would make you be an example. That respect should not be at the expense of equity and justice. Exactly. So that's why in some societies, in some societies, especially the developed societies, they have removed, you know, the, the application of equity and justice from the religious or ethnic bodies and made it and codified it in legal terms. As, as a standalone. Yeah. And that everybody yes. must, they must, must, must bound must be bound by it. Must bound by it. Yeah, exactly. So instead of allowing, for instance, some of the things that we take, we, we allow you know, cultures and society to d determine, they now do it in a codified law legal system where you now go in there and then let the law take its course. And the law is seen to be free and fair in okay. all applications. Now, um, there's a curious point here. Um, I've often wondered about it. This whistleblowing arrangement that we have also in Nigeria, as it also applies in other climes uh, uh, around the world. Are you satisfied with the way we've driven this whistleblowing arrangement in this country? Are you okay with it? Like everything else, everything everything everybody like, like everything in Nigeria, mm. the whistleblowing concept has been abused. It is more about financial rewards <laughs> than about public consciousness or public activity. In, so, in most cases, the whistleblowing is supposed to be a kind of citizen activity where people see things happening. Like at whatever level. Yeah, at whatever, whatever, level. whatever situation. Yeah. Not just financial. Yes, not just financial. See things happening that are, that are considered out of the ordinary or infractions to organize society. Things like neighborhood watch, for instance. Mm -hmm. People, when they see people fighting, in, in unnecessarily fighting without any prompting somebody will take a phone call i mean we take a we take a phone and call the authorities the police the civil i mean the civil police and all that and say look 
this, this is this is such and such is happening around here, and they give a description, and probably a police is there. That is part of the whistleblowing. I mean, it's not just about whistleblowing. I mean, of course, whistleblowing at the level of corruption is stealing public money. It is still, yeah, it's 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 good, it's understandable, but we have narrowed that concept of whistleblowing to just that uh, that area where well, people should be given are uh, given rewards only, well, well, only because you know, they, they, they expose some financial infractions. It should be a kind of social, you know, more social behavioral activity where when you see, for instance, at the, somebody, you know, uh, vandalizing a public, uh, you know, pu 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 public, uh, you know, uh, utility, utility or something, facility. or even to the point of somebody even, you know, urinating, you know, publicly, you are expected to actually you know, blow the whistle. Blow the whistle and say, I've noticed that this people, this person is doing this and has, has, has done it, and it is against what we think is uh, awesome. People are, 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 are organizing a party and making noise about it and, all kind, and disturbing the public order, public peace. You inform the society, you inform the authorities this is what's happening because the law has to be applied. Now, that's the way public, I mean, that's the way whistleblowing should be. But in Nigeria, it has been narrowed down to just financial rewards for infractions in the public, uh, in, in, a, in, in, in official, you know, public uh, behavior. So we, we need to really, really look at it again and then understand that it's all about public consciousness. And it is not about just, you know, it's not just about, it, it has to be, everybody should be part of it. It's not just about people, you know, who have access to, you know, uh, information in, in, at, at that high level. It should also be to the lowest levels of behavior and... Uh, in fact, well, as, as a public affairs analyst, this is very brief. Um, <coughs> do you see any redeeming features, let's put it this way, uh, to organize public, consci uh, public conscience in this country under the circumstance? Are there any redeeming features? Well, well I it's, a very, it's a tough one, really. I would have to confess because... On the one hand, what is happening in our country today does not give anyone any cause for to be very, very uh, optimistic about the fact that we can order our society in a way that would emphasize public good and also emphasize development. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, you have to be continue to be a, an optimist mm -hmm. because societies, I mean, we've seen what we've, we've, historical developments you know you know yields you know situations where you turn the corner and you begin to i mean that's what you know societies today the, the, the most advanced societies they started from this point where they also had this kind of you know uh, what do you, what do you call a seeming anomie of mm -hmm. behaviors mm -hmm. and of course some people within society took it upon themselves to say look we have to order this society and fixed it and fix it and they start from the basics right up to the most complex so it's possible it can happen in Nigeria, but at the moment, you know, uh, why, why a lot of people are pessimistic that, you know, would we, 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 we hit the bottom is because the people who are supposed to drive the society, who are supposed to drive these ethics, who are supposed to drive these, you know, behaviors, are themselves the culprits in it. Mm. So you begin to ask yourself, who will do it? And in most of these countries that have developed today, there has to be there, there's at the, at the point where they, 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 they try to now you know arrest this development you know some kind of people some people a class of people decided that look and took the lead yeah we would need to be able to do these things whether it's in form of revolutionaries or in form of you know uh, you know uh, you know uh, capitalists or all kind of things all they said all they decided was that look we need to organize the society there are a lot of redeeming values in the society that are hidden in the maze of you know issues that have become ir irredeemable we need to pick out those things emphasize them and use them as basis for for, for reconstructing society we've seen it happen mm. in in england in france in america in all that i mean for instance in america there's a concept of the, what they call the rubber barons mm. these are people who are taking a lot of things from society but at the same time they were giving it back in form of philanthropy in form of you know you know, enlightened issues, uh, uh, supporting causes that help the good of society. On the one hand, 
they were taking it from taking from society on the other hand they were giving it back and then forming a kind of you know a layer of ethics that becomes what is called the american way of life the same thing with the uk the same thing with france the same with germany and all that and they now organize society along that those lines but you, you know but in nigeria we still do not have we are still mad in ethnicity religion and all kinds of uh, so to be able to 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 that prevents us really from you know from 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 actually developing this you know uh, this 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 issues that will become the basis for society we've had constitutional changes we've had all kinds of ethic ethical you know uh, organization and institutions but they don't work now because the elite who are supposed to drive it have not even come into a consensus on how to really drive the society we all we hear is just glib talk about issues you know about this about that about you know all kinds of things but we don't see it in practice or at least trying to put together things that say look this is where we're going to go from here and anybody who who goes against we start from ourselves anybody who goes against this ethics or this defined ethics we take care of him and then we now make sure that the, the rest of society follows suit so that really yeah. where the problem is but i believe that well as we are going we may have a situation where this might happen well, thank you very much. Uh, we, um, I've had in the studio with me um, as my guests, Madam Ilias Mugadu, a uh, public affairs analyst and uh, an ethicist. Thank you very much for joining us on the program. You've added one more to <laughs> <laughs> The ethicist. Well, <laughs> <laughs> it's been exclusive interview. Thanks for being with us.